Let's create the controller, service, and repository. Under artifact package, let's create a class artifact controller. Then let's create artifact service. For the repository, it is called artifact repository, and it is an interface. Now remember, the controller depends on the service, and the service depends on the repository. Okay, let's add annotations to those classes so Spring can pick up those. For controller, let's add at rest controller. For service, let's add at service. Make sure the annotation is from org.springframework.stereotype. And here, the REST controller is from org.springframework.web.bind.annotation. For the repository, we can use at repository. Well, this annotation is optional, but I just put it here for consistency. This annotation is also from org.springframework.stereotype, but this is optional. Okay. We need to add one more annotation for the service class, that is at transactional. Recall the idea of transaction you learned from a database class. This annotation will make database transaction processing very easy in Spring Boot. We'll talk more about this later on. Next, let's inject dependencies into dependent. Now let's inject dependency into dependent. We know that artifact service depends on artifact repository. So first, let's inject artifact repository into artifact service. And here is how we do it. We're going to define a field for artifact repository, private final artifact repository, artifact repository. How do we inject? we can use constructor. Make sure you select this private final field and click OK. That's it. When we launch the Spring Boot project, the Spring IOC container will inject an instance of artifact repository into this artifact service. So you can use this field, this object, inside this class, okay? Artifact service does not have to worry about how to create and maintain this artifact repository object. Okay, similarly, let's inject artifact service into artifact controller. Private final artifact service. Constructor, select, and click OK. Next, let's work on the three methods. A method in the controller, a method in a service, and a method in the repository. We will see that later on. But let's start with controller. For each REST API endpoint, we need to create a handler method in the controller so that this method can process the request and return response. After the constructor, let's create the signature of this handler method. Public, and the return type should be result. And the name is find artifact by ID. And it takes one formal parameter, String artifact ID.
we have to let Spring Boot know that which API endpoint that this handler method is responsible for. And we do that through at request mapping. Well, this is a get request. So here is a different version of request mapping. It's called get mapping. And we have to specify the URL. And let me copy the URL from the API documentation. Scroll all the way up here. Well, this is not enough because remember the complete URL of an API endpoint is a combination of this URL and here, the base URL, localhost 8080 slash API slash v1. We don't have to include localhost 8080. We just need to add slash API slash v1. Then how do we retrieve this path parameter artifact ID? Well, Spring provides an annotation called at path variable to annotate the formal parameter of the handler method. So let's do it. So here we're going to add an annotation called at path variable. And guess what? Spring will automatically retrieve this artifact ID, this path parameter, and assign it or bind it to a formal parameter with the same name. So we have to make sure this name and this name, they match. Well, if they don't match, you will have to pass some values to path variable to let it know that this is the variable to hold the value in this artifact ID. Okay? But in most cases, I would recommend you make them the same. So that makes programming much easier. Right? So just make sure the name of the path variable is the same as the name of the formal parameter that will hold it. How convenient is that? Then what is this result class? I don't remember we defined it somewhere. That's right. We haven't defined this result class yet. It is a wrapper class that defines the schema of the response. So recall that the response of every API endpoint has a uniform format, which is like this. Flag, code, message, and data. Flag tells the client if the request is successful or failed. The code is a number that represents the status of the request. The message provides more details of the code. The data is the actual payload. It can be an artifact or a list of artifacts. This makes our API response uniform. The front-end team loves this because this makes it clear what to expect. To save some time, I will copy and paste the result class into our project. I have already copied the class, uh, but before I paste, let's create a new package to store the result class. Let's call it system. And paste. Well, actually, I pasted two classes into the project, result and status code. As you can see, here we have flag, code, message, data. And here we have a zero argument constructor. We have a three argument constructor. We have a four argument constructor. We're going to use this constructor a lot. That is, before the controller returns any result, the controller needs to use this result object to wrap around the returning result. Okay? And also gave a flag, a code, and a message. The second class I pasted in is called status code. As you can see here, we have success, invalid argument, unauthorized, forbidden, not found, internal server error, and so on. You may argue that we don't actually need this class since Spring Boot provides some HTTP status code. But in case your company has some custom status code, 
For example, your company may define some custom 400 level error codes. This class can be handy to store those extra codes or non standard status code. Next, let's move on to the service class. Let me close this, close this. But we have to import it here. Now it's not complaining. And we haven't implemented the details of this method. For artifact service class, let's define a method called the return type is artifact because this is find by ID. And it takes an artifact ID as input. So now it's not complaining about the compile error. Do you remember this at transactional? The at transactional at the class level will put every method in this class in its own transaction. It means that if a method throws an exception while executing, modification to a database in that method will be abandoned. In other words, a rollback occurs. So this is a very convenient annotation. You can add this annotation either at this level, method level, or if all the methods in this class needs transaction, just put it at the class level. Now let's move on to the artifact repository interface because service will not interact with the database itself. Instead, it will ask this repository object to help. Okay, here, be ready to be surprised. The only thing you need to do here is to have this interface extends another interface called JPA repository. And as you can see, this interface requires two generic types, T and ID. T refers to the domain type the repository manages, in this case, artifact. ID is the type of the ID of the entity the repository manages, in this case, because the ID of an artifact is string, so we put string here. That's it. Your job is done. This will enable Sprint Data to find this interface and automatically create an implementation for it. You as a developer don't have to provide any implementation. In other words, you don't have to write any code, at least for this moment. Thanks to the Sprint Data GPA, the process of accessing a database in a Sprint Boot project has been significantly simplified to two lines of code. Or, if I move it here, has been simplified to one line of code. Let's get it back. What happened behind the scene here is, by extending this JPA repository interface, we get the most relevant CRUD methods for standard data access available in a standard repository. So let's click into the JPA repository and let me show you some predefined CRUD methods. Click here. And as you can see, this interface extends more interfaces. And let's go to this one, least CRUD repository. And this one further extends CRUD repository. Click here. Let's scroll down. Look at here. After a series of extends, we come to this CRUD repository interface. In this interface, Sprint Data predefines the CRUD operations like save, save all. Look at here. Find by ID. Exists by ID. Find all. Find all by ID. Count. Delete by ID. Delete. Delete all by ID. Delete all. And so on. 
Let's go back. As I said, when the Spring Boot project is started, Spring Data will automatically create an implementation for our artifact repository so that we can find our artifacts, find artifact by ID, add artifact, update artifact, and delete artifact. We don't have to write a single line of code in here. Later on, I will show you how to define some custom finder methods. And again, Spring will provide the implementation automatically. Next, we're going to implement the methods we defined in the constructor and the service. See you in the next video.